Guys, so now I'm going to talk to you about the whole farm assessment. I'm going to talk about why we do the whole farm assessment and I'm going to run through how we actually score for the whole farm assessment and uh, how it relates to you. So first of all, why do we do a whole farm assessment? Or what is a whole farm assessment? A whole farm assessment is used to identify any potential water quality issues that might be uh, happening on your farm or up on your commonage because of you know, certain management practices. And that's important because, as you know, water is always travelling. It's going from your land into your drains, drains into streams, streams into rivers. And any issues that might be occurring on a commonage or on a farm or whatever can actually be carried away from that farm and into a stream, into a river and accumulate. And that can have damage such as damaging habitats like the uh, freshwater pearl mussel, or it can even have kind of economic impacts such as maybe like uh, a, a higher cost of water per a higher cost uh, per litre of clean drinking water. So that's why we do the whole farm assessment. So how does the whole farm assessment uh, relate to you? So basically your whole farm assessment, once the whole farm assessment is done, you're going to be uh, given a score of either excellent, good, inadequate or poor. And as you see there, each of those different categories has a number beside it. Excellent 1.2, good 1, inadequate 0 0.6, and poor 0 0.3. What that number means to you is whatever payment you are going to receive from your plot habitat scores, what Derek just went through, whatever payment you would have received from that, this number here is going to be used as a multiplier on that and that then will be your final payment. So what does that mean? So we take an example, if somebody was to be eligible for a thousand euros off their plot habitat scores, if they were awarded uh, an excellent score, if we went around and looked at, and I'm gonna run through that in a minute, what it is exactly we'll be looking at, but if somebody was awarded an excellent score, that thousand euros would be multiplied by 1.2, so you'll be getting, instead of getting a thousand euros, you're now getting 1200 euros. So you're getting an extra 200 euros. If you've been awarded good, that thousand euros multiplied by one, you get a thousand euros. If we came along and identified some issues, that thousand euros would be multiplied by 0 0.6. So now that thousand euros multiplied by 0 0.6 is 600 euros. So you've lost 400 euros in that instance. And if there were some very significant issues, the multiplier on that would be poor would be 0 0.3, so your thousand euros multiplied by 0 0.3. Now that thousand euros has gone down to 300 euros. Okay. So, and the idea behind that basically is is to try and reward excellent quality and incentivize. Then, if you get a low score, possibly what Joe will want to speak about later on is your support and actions. That rather than leaving an issue, you come along and maybe think about how could you improve that to get yourself maybe back up into good or even excellent. So, you all have a whole farm scorecard in your packets there, I hope. So if you wanna maybe take that out and we'll just run through it. So, just before we actually get into the bones of, of how the actual whole farm score, whole farm assessment is carried out, there's one important thing to note about it. On your whole farm scorecard there, you see there's five sections, A, B, C, D, and E. Whatever your lowest score in each in any of these five categories is, wherever you score lowest, that is what your whole farm score will be. So if you come along and in four sections you're scoring 1.2, but in one section you're scoring uh, 0.6, your whole farm score will be 0.6. And there's a good reason for that. And the reason for that is that all of these uh, th these five separate categories are deemed to be so integral to water quality that one of, that having a significant issue in one of them can't be ignored. It, 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 it has to be picked up in the scorecard here. Okay. So the first one here is the farmyard assessment. A. Do any of the following items present a risk to water course? So for this one here, this would be where we'd actually walk around, or the farm advisor would actually walk around your farm buildings, your sheds slatted sheds, where you store your animals, where you store your bales, all of that kind of thing. 
and what they'd be looking for there is any, any issues here, do any of the following items present a risk to water course? So do any of the things that you see here, do any of these things present a risk of pollution to a water course? Okay? So we'll just take, for example, silage pit. If your farm advisor who, who's doing this score or maybe it might be one of ourselves, if we came along and we found you have a silage pit there, and maybe there's a, a hole in the wall for some reason, maybe someone tried to put a pipe through it, who knows what was going on. If it happened, if there was visible evidence that there was effluent coming from that silage pit, and it had a direct pathway towards the water course, that would be an issue, and you'd be marked down to 0 0.6 in that instance there. As you see, that it says yes and no there, yes is 0 0.6, no is 1.2. Again, like round bale storage, if we came along and seen that your round bales were maybe stored in close proximity to a water course, to a river, and again, you could see some evidence of nutrification or some evidence of pollution coming from those bales towards that river, again, that would be an, an issue and you'd be marked uh, at 0 0.6. So, if there was no issue in that case, though we walked around the farm and there was no issue, that's a no there, and so you're at 1.2 and we move on to the next section, okay? So, okay, so the farm nutrient balance indicator. This here is only uh, applicable to people who have cattle, really, like, and, and, and particularly, and only, and not even if, just if you have cattle, really only if you're spreading slurry. So if you have sheep, or even if you have cattle and sheep, but you don't spread slurry, this doesn't really apply to you. But if you do spread slurry, then this, then this section would be filled out for you. So this section here is a calculation, and the calculation that it's trying to figure out here is, are the lands that you're spreading slurry on sufficient enough to take the load of nutrients that you're putting out on the land so that if you're putting too much nutrients onto the land, it's going to wash off into drains and again potentially into streams and rivers. So the two parts that go into that calculation is, number one, what's the extent of the suitable spread land in hectares? Basically, how many hectares are you spreading on? And the second question there is, the number of livestock units housed over winter. So basically, how much slurry are you building up that you're going to be putting out on that land? Okay? So, you've got three categories there. You've got poor, inadequate, and adequate. So just an example there might be, say if we take an example where you were housing 10 cattle over winter, and you were spreading on 6 hectares. That's good. That's adequate. Those six hectares are sufficient enough to take that load of nutrients without it spreading off and, and leaving the system. Inadequate, an example of that might be if you had ten, if you had ten cattle housed over winter and you were only spreading on four hectares. Okay, it's not it's not actually sufficient to take that load of nutrients and pour if you had ten cattle housed over winter and you were spreading on two hectares. Then that's you know that's serious enough. Like oh, a lot, a lot of the nutrients that you're putting out aren't going to go into the field and into the soil. It's going to go off and run off into streams and rivers. Okay. Okay. So the next question here: What is the level of damage to water courses as a result of uh, as a result of livestock or vehicular access? So you can see here in this picture here. This is an example of a high level of damage to a water course. Okay. You can see here that this cattle have free access into that, into that river there. There's no buffer zone. The cattle are collapsing the bank as they're moving into it and, we, and they're dunging in the river. So we're getting sediments, we're getting nutrients and the water course itself is being damaged. So there's a high level of damage uh, occurring to that water course. And that's, a, that's an example of animals. But likewise, it could be an example if, if you have, if, you're, if, if that was, if you made, made the man or a woman is crossing with a tractor or a quad through there repeatedly and they're churning up the sediment, they're, they're damaging the bank, that's a high level of damage to the water course. So in that instance there, you'd be getting scored a high there, be 0 0.3, a high level of damage to that, to that uh, river there. Now here's an example of none. Okay, so you can see here on the left hand side, this man, this person has completely fenced all the way along the river. They've left a buffer zone between the river and where the fencing is. And those animals now have no access into that river. They're not, they're not polluting in the river. They're not damaging that river. But it's important to note as well that it doesn't have to be fenced like that. What we're looking for when we're going out looking at this, we're looking for damage, actual damage, not potential damage, actual damage. So we can see here in this example, 
if we came out and seen this and we didn't see any damage, it, it, it doesn't have to be fenced, but there is no visible damage occurring to that water course, then again, there's no issue there. That's okay. But it's where we come along and we see damage, that's where the issue occurs. Okay, so the next section there, D. What is the level, what is the level of risk of sediment or nutrients entering the water course? Okay, so here again is an example of a high level of risk from sediment and nutrients from entering the water course. We can see up at the top of that picture there that there's actually cattle standing in that stream. Okay, so obviously they're going to be dunging and there's going to be nutrients from that entering that water course there. Down here we can see that the bank has collapsed here, maybe from where the cattle are going in. And again, sediment and clay and dirt is getting kicked up and moving into that water course there. So in this example here, we have the risk of nutrients and sediment entering that water course. So there's a high, there's a high risk of nutrient and sediment entering that water course in that example. And again, here's an example of no risk. We can't see any, there, we came across no evidence of nutrients or sediment entering the water course in this example here. So you can see it there yourselves, there's, there, there's no reason to assign risk in this scenario. Okay, so then uh, section E is the flow and it says here, describe the drains on the site. So this part here, and it's intuitive in terms of, you can understand that the, the as the drain is cleared and opened and free flown, anything that's coming off the land is able to go straight into that drain and fly, and any rainfall or anything is able to fly straight out of the system. As opposed to maybe a drain that's vegetated or slightly blocked, you can see when nutrients or sediments are entering into that drain, they're not, they don't have the freedom to just leave the system as they do in the example here where the drains are totally open and free and clear. Okay? So that there is an example of high risk we see a clear open drain, any nutrients or sediments are going in there and are just being washed out of the system. And here, uh, here's an example of a low risk and of no risk. So this one here is low risk. You can see that uh, the drain is vegetated, the, there is very little flow in that drain. So whatever issue, whatever potential issues there may have been in that field. They're, they're, they're entering that drain, but they're not able to escape that drain very well. There's a slight flow in it, but it's not, it's, it's not a very heavy flow coming out of it. And here's an example of no risk. So that drain there is non-functional. It might have been a past drain, but it, it, it doesn't work anymore. It's been fully blocked up, fully vegetated, and there's no risk of any of the nutrients or sediments from, entering the, from exiting the drain.